Well, Father Alexander was a, first of all, a, a man of the church, I think above all. He was a great scholar as well, but he dedicated his scholarship to the, the life of the church and the, the pastoral world that uh, our clergy and our parishes have to navigate. And, and I think that was his great contribution to the church. As a teacher, I think he was legendary. And those who have been in his classroom, and I've, I've discussed this with many people who have been, uh, talk about his power uh, behind the podium, uh, his ability to, to communicate a message, not simply in terms of theories or abstractions, but a, but a living reality. And um, I, I think that comes through in his writings, especially for the life of the world. First time I'd heard of Father Alexander Schmemann, I think I was in college at the time, and friends of mine actually discouraged me from ever reading him. And when I asked them why, they told me that that he challenged the traditions of the church and I should stick to more traditional writings. And of course, I wasn't going to settle for that. I wanted to read it because I asked them, did you read it? And they said no. So they had nothing really to say to me about the books. I would say that he was not an innovationist. He was a restorationist. He's one who recalled us to open the lid of the treasury of orthodoxy and begin to live in a liturgical rhythm, a liturgical life uh, that was centered again at the altar and to understand what that means to be a baptized Christian, to be one who is immersed in Eucharistic living. Uh, his was a time in which many people were very confused through poor catechesis. Uh, I've met people who have said to me, for instance, the restoration of pre-sanctified liturgies uh, that they grew up in the Orthodox Church never seeing one, never hearing of one. And these are all things which Schmemann, of course, brought back. They were integrated into the life of the Church, which we now simply take for granted. Uh, but they were not innovations. They were things that existed in the Church, but we had forgotten them, were no longer using them, and he sort of represented them for us uh, in a fresh light. And it took root, and it has taken root not only in North America, but literally around the world. I was a kid, nobody went to communion. You, you got to confessing age and you went to communion once a year to keep your membership. Uh, when, and now, um, I mean, everybody knows that liturgy is a meal where we go and we prepare ourselves uh, to receive the banquet of the uh, king. And uh, that was uh, the result of For the Life of the World. No matter his theology or the brilliance of his theology, it was always, how is it going to be used in the parish? How are the people going to receive this? How are the people going to discover God through the church and through the services? In one of his books, he asked a question, can a church that's ascetical and liturgical and uh, filled with a certain sense of mystery, can it truly be missionary? And his answer was emphatically, yes, not only could it be missionary, it had to be missionary. That was the whole purpose of the church. Growing up as a Methodist and being a Methodist minister, I was a uh, succumb to the worldview that a sacrament was symbol, the Eucharist was symbol, it, uh, somehow it ended there. And Father Alexander's teaching about the sacramental life of the world, that, that symbol points beyond itself to a reality that we can participate in. It, instead of this two-dimensional world, it's a three-dimensional world. Without that three-dimensional world, we're, we're robbed of reality. But the universe is, is an epiphany of God that you can look at a tree and see xylem and phloem, or you can look at a tree and see the incredible beauty of God. And it really all depends on 
how you look and how you interact with creation, what your relationship with it is. So one tendency of religious people, whether Christian or non-Christian, is towards uh, superstition, towards seeing the things that we do uh, and the things that we eat religiously and partake of religiously as some kind of a magic. I think for the life of the world helps people to see that the sacraments are not magic, uh, that they are a holistic expression of God incarnate in the world and incarnate including in material things specifically the bread, wine, oil, the stuff of the sacraments, but beyond that, through the sacraments, into the entire world in its materiality. And that's the second um, thrust of Father Alexander and of the book that counters another religious tendency. There's a very, very powerful religious tendency to separate the spiritual world from the material world and treat them as totally different entities and to treat spiritual things as good and material things as bad. For the life of the world absolutely destroys that kind of dualism and it invites us into a very unified and holistic view of the church for sure but also of the world where the spiritual and the divine is in the world it is not of the world but it is in the world and it is for that reason we can say Lo, it is good to be here. That's one of the things Father Alexander often used to say, quoting St. Peter at the Transfiguration, Lord, it is good to be here. One of the images um, that I that I extracted from Father Alexander that I've never lost, and I, it comes to mind almost weekly. Uh, he talks about the liturgy of assembly. He's talking about those efforts that have to be made to come to the community of Christians and to, to worship God together. He talks about the liturgy of assembly and how everything you do has a liturgical aspect. And the image I have is like putting on your socks or forcing yourself to get out of bed on Sunday morning. <laughs> this is part of the, the liturgy of assembly. And, but the broader point that I think Father Alexander was making is that all aspects of life can be sanctified, not simply those that we typically think of as church-related, the celebration of the sacraments and whatnot, but everything in life, there, there is a, a joy which is simply there by appreciating it, recognizing that possibility. In 1983, when he came and addressed the All-American Council, it was my first All-American Council, and of course the first one women were allowed to be delegates. And just um, the admiration and love and really uh, um, the respect, just but mostly just the incredible love uh, that that just, you know, um, uh, spread through the room when they saw that he was there and he was very frail and climbing the stairs. And I don't even remember what he said, just remember him climbing those stairs and the amazing reception that he had from the people in the room. It's hard to give expression to this, but I'd say that especially perhaps towards the end of his life, Father Alexander found it increasingly important, even as he maintained this kind of affirmative and joy-filled encounter with the world, that he also acknowledged evil and sin and the devil. And among the last words that he spoke to a classroom at this seminary were uh, words of reminder that the devil exists. So that a affirmative disposition that is at the absolute root of Father Alexander's character and his being was not um, an innocent or naive joy, a naive affirmation. It was an affirmation made in the awareness of the existence of evil as a deadly serious thing, uh, evil which has indeed been overcome in Christ but that it has to be overcome in Christ in all of us. 
it's our apostolic ministry to receive the life that Christ offers us, but then to share that life, to bring that life into that broken world uh, that is suffering, that is uh, seeking, that is confused. And so that's a call for us to, to fulfill Christ's commandment to, to not only to baptize, but to preach and to teach and, and to above all share the gift of, of healing that our Lord offers us.